Hello and welcome listeners to the Let's Talk About Grief podcast. If you followed or listened to previous episodes, you'll know I like to offer hope by sharing my guest stories with you. You get to hear how they have navigated their own grief, which can be both helpful and healing, knowing you too can move forward after a loss. If this is your first time and you don't know me, I'm Andy Butte, your host and author of Grief's Abyss. And this is part of my mission to help demystify grief. Hello, dear listeners. Thank you for joining us today as we continue on our journey with grief. Today, we're going to be delving into divorce. And it's a subject I don't know if society or we ourselves readily acknowledge that the pain and grief experienced when a marriage ends can often be very the same sort of emotions as when there's a death of a a spouse or a death of a relationship. And it's not readily recognized that divorce is indeed a death. It's a death of the dreams and hopes the couple had. So yes, there's the intense pain. Because I I certainly feel I'm going to ask my guest in a moment what his perceptions are. I because I don't believe society recognizes it as a grief. The person going through a divorce doesn't have the same support or comfort that you would get or expect if it was indeed uh, the death of a person. There's no rituals. There's no comfort, as I mentioned, certainly no the supports are, are pretty limited. And the person going through the divorce can actually feel isolated and alone. And then family and friends, I'm certain you may have said this yourself or heard it. Oh, you can find somebody else. There's plenty of more fish in the sea. Well, how supportive, how... Uh, compassionate can that be? Because really, it's not as simple as finding a new a partner. The desire isn't for somebody new, but for the one we had. So the journey of divorce is both complex and deeply emotional. And it goes far beyond just seeking a replacement. And if there's children involved, It can create custody battles and it can be traumatic no matter what age the child is. They want the parents to stay together. They don't want the parents to divorce. And really, it can have long lasting effects on them well into adulthood. Now, our guest today, I'm certain, remembers only too well the emotional roller coaster of grief for when his own marriage ended 40 years ago. Why discuss this now? Well, listeners, please stay with me and you'll understand more in a moment. Our guest, Vernon Bomrand, he's a father, grandfather, and a successful businessman based in Charlotte, North Carolina. He's also the author of a book called Deceit. It's a true story of domestic infidelity and betrayal with details recorded by a wiretap. Welcome, Vernon. It's lovely to have you on the show again. Well, thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. Oh, how gracious. Looking forward to speaking with you. Oh, you are. Thank you. When we spoke last, I remember you mentioning that you were having a birthday. That's correct. <laughs> <laughs> and I, because you're not a female, I'm, I'm going to be bold and ask, how old <laughs> did you just turn? Uh, um, I just turned 80. <laughs> 
How fabulous. Was it a big birthday bash? Did all the family come into town? It was larger than my sixth birthday, at which I had probably eight or 10 children in a tent. <laughs> <laughs> this time there were about 38 people there. <laughs> oh my goodness. So you did it in style. I, yeah. I wanted to mention your age because I don't know, again, society's perception as we get older, then writing a book or, or changing careers, it's why it's you're too old, it, it's too late, but you've proven it's not. You did write a book, didn't you? That's correct. That's correct. <laughs> the only book I've ever written and likely the only book I will ever write. Although, <laughs> well, I'm, working, although I'm working on a second edition of this book. Okay. Right? It's one of those things that just keeps growing, doesn't it? It, it keeps growing. Yeah. <laughs> I've had uh, re lots of reviews on Amazon and some podcasts and all of them suggest you know, there are questions that people have and yeah. these questions are repeated time after time. And so uh, I've decided <laughs> um, there's some there's some additional material that the book deserves. And I'm going to include an epilogue also at the back of the book in which I'm going to put specific questions that have been asked on, okay. on, pod podcasts. on, on, on podcasts. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because when people begin to, which we'll go into in a moment, uh, hear your story, yeah, it's um, one of those things. And I'm sure listeners, if if any of what we're about to share um, resonates with you and you have more questions, I believe on somewhere in <laughs> the, the show itself, you can actually uh, correspond with me. How that works, I don't know. I'll leave it up to you, smart listeners, to discover it. But I know we can interact now. Uh, we now have that uh, platform uh, on the uh, on the podcast, and perhaps I'll have to try DMing myself. Then I'll be able to share. <laughs> so, Vernon, when I was sort of giving the intro, when you look back, when you were going through a divorce. Would you say that society's views have changed very much from what I sort of shared? No, I don't think society's views have changed a whole lot. It has been 45 years, not 40 years. So it's Oh, where did I get that? 40, 40, 45 years ago. Uh, but um yeah, I think uh yeah, everything that you said resonated with me very closely. Um, so, you know, I would agree that there's a lot more support when there's the death of a loved one as there is in a divorce. You, mm -hmm. Divorce is not something that you're very pr proud of and, um, you know, you don't really want to be talking about it. And you're you're hoping that people don't, not even are aware of it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Was there a lot of stigma and shame 45 years ago? You know, I don't think there there was to an extent, but not not significantly. OK, there were still a lot of divorces and mm -hmm. lots of uh, experiences similar to mine that were occurring. Because yeah, mine did have a little different twist to it. It uh, certainly did, didn't it? Going back to your story, before we jump right into it, as I said, when you look back, how has that experience of of your divorce? I know it was uh, there was a lot of trauma and it wasn't a straightforward one. How has it shaped your path towards finding the resilience that supported you? I'm not sure that uh, necessary. I think I'm the same person that I was then. I haven't yeah. changed a lot. You know, of course, we all grow. Yes, we, yeah. All experiences, good and bad. Yeah. Um, but I'm pretty much the same individual that I was. I, I resorted to um, the strengths that I had to get through that process, just like I have 
uh, in recent years. You, you all, we all have ups and downs, and our our careers take different paths. Um, and uh, we're always um, accommodating change, and um, that's the way we get through life. In most cases, because you know, there's some folks that don't handle it very well. Yeah. Fortunately, fortunately, I I was able to uh, handle what was thrown at me, and okay. apparently fairly well. Not not that um, uh, I was able to escape the pain and uh, you know the emotional um, trauma. Um, over the years, I've had a tendency occasionally to sink back into the thoughts of the past, and mm-hmm. uh, I've lived with some regret. But overall, um, things really turned out favorably. I don't want to ruin the story for those who are interested in reading it, <laughs> uh, but um, in the end result was really good, and because the children were of of supreme importance to me. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so in revealing to some some extent revealing some of the story uh that was the objective was to secure custody of the children because of things that were going on i felt i was the better parent of the two and uh and my children have uh turned out magnificently well mm-hmm. uh, and they are in their 40s themselves at this point yeah uh, so they've the results of what happened have stood the test of time. Yeah. So they certainly, it doesn't sound as if they experienced what I mentioned before, how some children custody battles can experience it into late life, eh? Like uh, adult life. Right. Um, I'm sure that my children's lives were impacted. They were definitely, they were impacted um, they've come through it as strong individuals, fortunately. Um, but this, you know, there's still there's still some lingering pain. Yes. Um, yeah. Even but now. now they were only four and two years of age at mm-hmm. the time. So, um, the two year old hardly knew the difference. Yeah. The four year old was a little more um, sensitive to the events that mm-hmm. were occurring. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, when they're that young, Vernon, children tend to think it's their fault. You know, if I'd have been a better person, a, a good boy or good girl, then my parents would have stayed together. That's uh, one avenue that I hear that children kind of take it on, that it was their fault. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think that necessarily applied in our case. I was really very, very fortunate. I did have the support of a wonderful family, parents, mm. a sister who had a child the same age as, as mine, and we just kind of bonded together through this. And it gave my two children a lot of balance that they would not otherwise have had. And mm. I really attribute the kinds of people my adult children are today very much to my parents and my sister mm. uh, and so their cousin you, with whom and their cousin. <laughs> yeah. so they um it sounds like because of the supportive family it helped you get through what you were experiencing yes early, early on yeah five or six years um we remained very close um and then, of course, we moved away. We were in a small town in South Carolina, and we moved to Charlotte uh, after about, I think it was six years. Okay. Uh, and then I was on my own with them. But I had a really good start with them. Yeah, yeah. The book Deceit is pretty, the title in itself, uh, and the description. I know you don't want to give too much away, but... What's it about? Can you give us the Coles notes? Sure. The book Deceit is a never told, unprecedented true story of intimate betrayal captured by wiretap. 
It's a story that can never occur again. It, um, it's of a loving father facing formidable legal odds to secure custody of his two small children uh, using wiretap technology uh, that's not possible today because cell phones, which came into vogue in the mid 1980s, um, can't be wiretapped. Mm. So this father was able to turn the tide in his favor in the case of a cheating wife and her manipulative, um, morally corrupt gynecologist um, who had who was a lifelong sexual predator with power and authority, whose vile exploits um, had devastating effects on everyone in his sphere. Mm. Uh, the revelation of this story uh, and its details are eye-opening. Although the story took place in in late 1978 and 1979 and actually continued it, with the litigations that ensued mm -hmm. in the early 80s, um, its content is relevant today because human nature has not changed, Yeah, uh, you know, over time. And the, the lessons of the story remain as applicable today as they were then. Yeah. Basically, yeah. it's a story of humility and perseverance um, over arrogance status and the powerful influence of sex addiction while delivering valuable lessons in conscience and consequences. Mm -hmm. But the, uh, with uh, recorded intimate details, the account gained national acclaim for the legal precedent of the wiretap case and the publicity that yeah. resulted from nationwide uh, news coverage of the legalities, including the airing of the story on ABC's 2020 program that was narrated by Barbara Walters and Hugh Downs okay. in 1985. Um, but because of the indecent content of the captured conversations on the wiretap and the detrimental impact that may have had on young children in their formative years, mm -hmm. uh, the judge in this case, um, can sit, he uh, uh, seal the, the the files. Okay, yeah. The end of the the uh, domestic hearing in the custody hearing, so they were they were were sealed, um, including the transcription transcriptions of those tapes. Um, so only now, forty five years later, is the complete story being revealed, okay. uh, including the content of the tape conversations. But so um, those conversations, then you've. You've readily put them into the book, have you? Yes. Yeah. Wow. That might so, be a difference into what you would have done 45 years ago, which we wouldn't have done that, but today we would. It's yeah. a little more acceptable today. Yeah. Just being able to get a wiretap and have it submitted, as you said, times have changed on that because you'd now need a warrant, wouldn't you, for any of that? Uh, Likely, it actually, it changed dramatically in a very short period of time. Shortly after I did this, and I was vindicated by the lower courts, and it was appealed to the federal Supreme Court, the, the federal Supreme Court agreed with the lower courts, and I was vindicated mm. uh, because of the particular circumstances of my wiretap. The wiretap was on a telephone that was in my name. It was on wires within the confines of my home. It was my only means of defense. The courts decided, okay. uh, proclaimed that the doctor was not entitled to any privacy within the confines of my home. And they mm -hmm. ruled that I, I was within my rights. But it was like 18 months later, they reversed the decision. Oh, but did I got, they? Uh, I got in under the wire. Because <sighs> a, a, a year and a half later, my attorney said, if you'd done this today, that would have been in probably 1981, you'd go to jail. Oh, my goodness. So, so it now carries a sentence then. Right. Wow. So clearly, as you mentioned, you had that resilience and patience to carry out what you your intent was to get full custody of the children and that was what kept you going i understand that's that's correct yeah so that uh, resilience was there when you were sharing this with me when we first uh, spoke 
I couldn't help think about what your emotional state would have been at that time, finding out of your wife's infidelity. And instead of going into the grief and the pain, it was almost as if you shut that part of yourself off and you went into that rational part of your brain for you to carry out what you needed to do. Is that a good summation <laughs> of it? That's correct. <laughs> um, the events that developed were totally unexpected to me. Um, I was only 34 at the time. She was 31. You know, had a four-year-old, two-year-old. My immediate response was denial. You know, mm. think, oh my God, please let this not be true. Then with the reality, the truth setting in, um, I became angry at myself for being so stupid, for allowing mm. this to happen. I was thinking, you know, feeling I was to blame. How could I be so stupid? And then my anger pivoted to her for cheating, for lying, yeah. deceiving, betraying me, yeah. uh, you know, being disrespected. It was all mixed in and intertwined with um, emotions fluctuating between anger, disappointment, illusionment, dis disillusionment, sadness. And then ultimately my anger was redirected to him mm -hmm. because I knew he was in control and was orchestrating everything from his position of power as her gynecologist. Mm -hmm. Although I wasn't so naive as to not recognize that she had facilitated the circumstances. She was an enabler. Mm -hmm. um, so they were equally as guilty, but I felt, I felt every emotion in the whole spectrum of human emotions, including mm -hmm. wanting to cry, mm -hmm. wanting to beg her to come back and, you know, wanting and wanting to, to express my anger physically. Mm. Uh, I had just experienced three or four months of her ill treatment of me, not knowing why and, you know, and not suspecting what was already in process. Um, I knew I was being jettisoned for something more attractive to her, mm -hmm. a doctor, a, a bad boy gynecologist mm. uh, that I could not compete with. Um, and with this revelation, I quickly realized that my children were at stake here. And I knew I was the better, like I said earlier, more stable parent and should re remain dominant in their lives. Yeah. Um, she and I had talked about how derelict he was. He would, he and his wife and two children as well mm -hmm. moved into our neighborhood. So we were neighbors, three doors oh, down gosh. in the street. So I knew them well and knew that his... Um, his children were starved for attention. They were down at our house all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, so wow, I, I couldn't allow my children to fall into his hands. Uh, so, so knowing I, all that was what made you, was it a planned decision to tap your phone to get, get evidence? Not I didn't think about a wiretap initially. You know, I got control of my raw emotions knowing that she was lost. Okay. And only the children were left. And knowing right away, I'm going to, uh, I've got to compose myself. I got to control my emotions and my impulses Ooh. to give myself time and the opportunity to take measures necessary um, to fight for custody, to the right to remain dominant in their lives. And yeah. at the same time, I knew, well, the chances of getting custody for the man was remote, very remote. Mm -hmm. uh, but mm -hmm. re revealing what I knew by confronting either one of them would have been disastrous. Uh, had I done that, they would then know that I knew what was happening. And then they would sort of take steps necessary to counteract my actions and all, and all of what I accomplished and the revelation um, would have been lost, including the children. So, so I had to remain silent yeah. and uh, um, to proceed with measures that I had yet to employ. Mm -hmm. And then the next, you know, until I figured everything out and, and it didn't take long for me to put all the pieces of the puzzle together. 
and figure out what I had to do. And the first thing I had to do is I need to know, needed to know what they were saying. Okay. Cause I, I realized, um, yes, you know, I can remember coming home and her quickly hanging up the telephone, mm. Your little signs like that. And, uh, and so that was the next thought I had was tapping the telephone. Okay. And then of course, when I heard the first conversations, um, I knew then it was even more important for mm-hmm. me to be the one obtaining custody of the children. Yeah, yeah. You raise a very valid point because I, I don't know what it's like today, but 45 years ago, yeah, it was normal for mums, regardless, to get custody, wasn't it? Yes, it was, Yes. So you saying that it was rare that uh, men actually got custody. So that was a remarkable feat, Vernon. You kind of suspect, but as you said, denial. You don't want it to be true. You do everything you can to tell yourself stories as to why I'm certain the behavior before that you were doing just that to sort of make yourself feel, you know, secure. No, no, there's nothing wrong. It's just this, this, and this. And then when the behavior becomes such that you can't ignore the shock that just drains through your body, the adrenaline, the rage, and as you mentioned, the whole gamut of emotions came in This is where I find you remarkable and your resilience to be able to control all that. And again, go back to have the wherewithal to be able to say, well, yes, I wanted to confront, I wanted to do this, but if I do this. So really holding yourself in check. How did you do that? The children were my source of strength. Yeah. As I listened to the tape recorded conversations, um, I knew from the from the content of that first conversation, I knew that she was lost. Mm. He was in complete control. And. um, You know, I I was just determined I was going to have to contain as I say, contain my emotions and control my impulses. And I was I was able to do that for, I thought this was going to take months. Mm-hmm. For it, all. it was only 25 days okay. because um, I had the wiretap intact. I hired detectives. I hired the best attorney that I could find. We all... Everybody did their job. I coordinated with them. I knew everything that was going on in advance because of the wiretap. I was able to coordinate everything. Mm. In 25 days, my attorney said, we've got what we need. I I called him telling him, um, I can't contain myself anymore. This was 25 days into this, and I hadn't said anything. I just, you know. We weren't we weren't living a normal existence together at that point, but there weren't you know we weren't having arguments and we weren't making accusations and it was just that we were existing. Mm-hmm. And but I got to a point where I didn't feel like I could contain myself any longer, and I called the attorney and he said, "We don't have to wait any long. You don't have to wait any longer. Okay, we, we have what we need, and that's part yeah. of this story." Um, they were so bad over a three week period, and it was all documented just time after time after time rendezvous you know meeting mm. at his office in a in the public park in our home oh, in my absence yeah. uh, it's just it's um uh, everybody who's read the story you know, accepts that nobody is contesting it, but it, it even seems almost impossible to me that yes. this happened yeah. as it did, which it, in fact it did. Yeah, but that goes back to 
your resilience and your ability to contain your emotions and hold yourself in check. Because any time during those 25 days, you could so easily have blown it and all what you had done would have not been, <laughs> it would have been for naught, eh? Exactly. Um, yeah, I uh, I didn't put this statement in the book, but I'm going to put it in the second edition. At the very back of the book, there's a little okay. section in chapter 19, and there's a section on grateful me. There's a section on him, on her. How could this have happened? Um, why the story is important to tell. There's a section on the gifts, the children, and then there's a section on grateful me. And I'm getting ready to add in that second addiction, edition this statement, if anything had gone wrong and I was found out, all would have been lost. They would have been able to turn the tables on me. Mm. And it, it just dawned on me that I hadn't told the reader that, how important it was that I hold myself together. Yeah. Uh, so Cele Celebrating yeah. you, <laughs> as I keep saying. Uh, I mean, I'm sure anybody that will be listening to our interview will be amazed because anger boils up and the resentment and the vengeance. And it, well, that's what leads to the acrimonious custody battles, isn't it? The children become pawns at any time. Were they used? I know not from you, but were they ever used as pawns in any of this? They were not, mm. fortunately. Well, I was granted temporary custody immediately. Okay. So, so I had it. I was the custodian from the beginning to the end. Mm -hmm. And I made sure there was there were no acts of retribution or you know never any attempt to use the children as pawns oh wonderful of course from the other side there wasn't there was a there was a little of that mm. you know the children coming home after weekend visits and telling me you know would would stories that I'd have to straighten out with them yeah there was so there was a little bit of that but it wasn't uncontrollable and You're I don't right. think, I don't think it uh was used to the extent that it harmed the children. Mm -hmm. So it was just the way you handled the whole situation. They clearly trusted you in all of this, and to be able to open up and share what what this what was going on or what was being said, so that you could correct it. Right. Well, I deliberately um, to counter some of the comments that they would come back with, they would come back and tell me, mommy hates you. Mm. Daddy, mommy hates you. To counter that, I would tell them, well, I'm sorry she feels that way. I will always love her for mm. what we shared for you and Jenny. Mm -hmm. I'm talking to my son. He was the older one. He would yeah. come back and tell me this. Uh, I would. I would let them know that I loved her for what we shared together mm -hmm. for them. Yeah. Just counter, you know, counter uh, any negativity that there was. And mm -hmm. there was a little, but there, I don't think there was a, I, I think she too probably realized that that was a very, um, uh, there was a tendency to use the children as pawns, and I don't think she did that to any great degree. Which you can be internally grateful for, for sure. You've written the book. It's got all the details that were these shared with on 2020 with Barbara Walters? Um, you know, they weren't too interested in... Uh, the, they weren't too interested in the story. What they were interested in was the wiretap. Oh, the fact um, that you had been able to get. Yeah, and they they were basically doing a story on um, 
wiretapping cases that were cropping up all over the country as a result of this case. Oh, I see. And okay. And the federal Supreme Court remanded the case back to the state level mm -hmm. to proceed at trial, and they disallowed this doctor had sued me for invasion of privacy it was as a result of the wiretap. And of course, there was a federal indictment pending also mm -hmm. for violation Gosh. of the federal wiretapping statutes. And we had, before we could go to trial with him, and this was after the custody, uh, mm -hmm. the divorce custody hearing, there was a trial with him. He sued me and I sued him. I sued him for alienation of affections, criminal conversation, which is intimacy with the spouse of another, mm. old English law. Yeah. Malpractice. And he sued me for invasion of privacy. And then they his legal team instigated the uh, federal indictment for violation mm. of federal wiretapping statutes. And they had to wait until all the lower courts ruled on the wiretapping issue when the federal Supreme Court remanded it back to the state then his lawsuit was disallowed and we proceeded to trial. Oh, my goodness. Clearly something bigger was at stake here and you were being guided and well protected, eh, <laughs> with all of this. Now, having spent my life first as a nurse but working in the medical profession, being up against the medical legal team to get a doctor disbarred is no mean feat either, is it? But that is what I understand when we had our conversation, that that's what happened. He was disbarred. Um, well, event, eventually he was, uh, his license was suspended. That didn't okay. happen until after my trial with him. Of course, all this was in the newspapers and it was all over the country. And mm -hmm. um, I even had telephone calls from people warning authors, wanting to write this story back in yeah. the early 80s. And that and my attorney said, Vernon, you had better write this story and copyright it or someone else is going to do it because we were mm -hmm. refusing to do it. We, mm -hmm. we were in litigation, so we, you can't write a book when you're in litigation. I know that's done. But yeah. today, but I was advised <laughs> not to write a book while we're in litigation or talk about it. So mm. we didn't do that. Um, but um, there was a lot of publicity. When the trial was over, I because of all the publicity, there were witnesses, um. women who stepped forward. They were reading the newspaper accounts. About 11 of them. Oh, my con goodness. Contacted me and uh, said, we're not going to do this on our own, but collectively we'll, we'd like to complain. Mm. And so we banded together and uh, I filed the complaint with the medical board. Okay. And then they had a hearing and all of us testified in one day and they ended up suspending his license. I think he appealed it, but eventually mm -hmm. they suspended his license, and then he had to move. He lost his hospital privileges mm. in the town that we were living in. Um, and then, of course, he couldn't practice then, and yeah. so he, is, he, he moved from state to state, and uh, this was when, this was before, and this is in the book, um, this was before there was a list of bad doctors. In the, oh, okay. in the 80s. That didn't happen until there was an act that Congress put together in the mid, probably the late 80s, where they, um, I forgot the name of the, the source, but it's a the book that anybody can go to and look up doctors and learn about their history. That didn't exist. So a doctor could simply moved from state to state. Oh, my goodness. Until his reputation caught up with him. Mm which it did in this case, they moved seven or eight times over mm. his career. Mm -hmm. So it followed him, but he was able to practice in other states. Oh, good gracious. You get, yeah. you get your, your licenses in a state. Yeah. If you lose it in one state, you just move to the, the next state. Oh, my goodness. Okay, let's start with the reason why the book is coming out now, or it, it came out a little while ago. 
what was your motivation? Why now? Let's go um, there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> this story needed to be, it should have been told earlier. Okay. Uh, un- undoubtedly, the elements um, in this chronicle have been repeated countless times by others, just like this doctor. Um, you know, s- since the story occurred, and there, and probably there are instances where this is occurring even now. Okay. Uh, and uh, the details are illuminating, and they provide knowledge that's beneficial uh, to everyone. Uh, and the life's lessons that are that are to be learned in this story um, were suppressed. They were they're powerful lessons, and they were suppressed all this time. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, I kept thinking about this over the years, and and I think just as I approached the my age of 80, I began <laughs> to realize that, you know, it would be derelict for me to take this story to my grave, uh, okay. ir- irresponsible and an injustice to my fellow man. I've already waited too long to help some, you know, many people benefit by my having postponed the telling of this tale. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I just realized it would be a travesty. Uh, for humanity to keep the story under wraps where it has been all these many years now and to go untold. So I talked to the to adult kids and told mm. them this is what I felt I needed to do. And uh, they didn't object. They agreed with you, I would imagine. Yeah. Kind, of, kind of reluctantly, you know, because of their mother. Yes. She and he are still, they're married. So, you know, we're concerned about the impact on them. But the most important thing is uh, humanity, uh, more important than just us. Mm-hmm. Um, but as I say, there are um, there are a lot of life lessons in this story, and I've got them in the book. And I've, yeah. I've actually, I'm actually listing them in the epilogue. Okay, uh, so people can go there. Well, it sounds as if you've got a very detailed description of what infidelity and rejection and deceit can feel like. You've you've shared that with us. And possibly, for me, one of the lessons would be how to control your emotions so that they don't run away with you um, and stop you from perhaps being the bigger person. Absolutely, of all the uh, lessons in this story, the one that I think is the most important um, is the comment I hear the most, predominantly in reviews of the book, that Mm -hmm. in comparison to their own marriages, uh, after having read this story, readers are more appreciative for the spouses that they have. I can't tell you how many times I've had I've heard that comment, and it okay. and it does give me a really good feeling that that um, that the story does give people an appreciation. It, it's illuminating. It provides a better, a greater appreciation for and and commitment to the bonds of love that currently exist in a mm. lot of people's lives. So, in a sense, you're helping couples remain together just by recognizing what their lives could have been like. Absolutely. And uh, and I I think I didn't address the comment that you made, but uh, in the midst of circumstances like those in this story, Mm -hmm. in the position that I was in as the protagonist, um, one may feel every emotion within the whole spectrum of human emotions, perhaps the most powerful emotion being anger. Yeah. Wanting to yeah. strike, wanting to resort to violence. Yes. Um, but ultimately, in controlling one's emotions and containing our worst impulses, gives us an opportunity to take stock of the circumstances, mm-hmm. uh, kind of assess, you know, what's where we are, what's going on, and to consider what's most important to us, and to yeah. act with wise discretion. And uh, you know, sometimes this might just be to give yourself time to resolve issues. But in this case, it was being composed and pursuing effective measures to outwit and outmaneuver the opponent. 
mm. which was central to the story. Yeah. Yeah. Are you a good chess man? Do you play chess? <laughs> I don't play chess. I play tennis. <laughs> oh, okay, so lot, I guess there's a there's strategy a there. Strategy involved in tennis. That's correct. <laughs> <laughs> that just popped into my head. Yeah. Sorry, I yeah. I didn't yeah. mean to detract from the seriousness uh, of it all. Uh, and I was going to say, and the older you get, and the more <laughs> tennis you play, the more devious you become in the game. <laughs> So don't mess with Vernon now, eh? (laughs) Beautiful. What would be the lesson around the medical profession? Because I'm suspecting there's an awareness potentially. How have you how have you framed that? Um, you know, one of the lessons is for those who are inclined. Uh, toward uh, self-centered behavior, as this okay. guy is. This story gives pause for reflection on the myriad and immeasurable negative consequences of irresponsible and thoughtless actions, mm-hmm. such as those that were demonstrated by both of these antagonists. Mm-hmm. So, okay. um, but they're the devastating effects of addiction to sex and pornography. He was addicted. He had uh, been addicted to pornography since he was a child, a Mm. teenager. teenager. Oh, wow. It had morphed into um, worse. Mm. I wasn't too certain if you were sort of creating an awareness for women in those vulnerable moments in their lives regarding the medical profession. We see them as gods and it's probably not a good place for us to be. We give them all the power. We feel very vulnerable. So you can sort of see how, advantages can't you can be taken oh yeah um really that's the reason i felt like the story needed to be told because this doctor's behavior persists to this day in others who follow the same path Mm. Uh, very important to see how this this unscrupulous professional operated and to understand how the tragedy that resulted from his conduct was possible when you read this book you understand you understand it comes very clear to you. Okay. He was controlling, he was domineering, he was manipulative, he had an attitude mm. of entitlement. Um, mm. Powerful element at play uh, mm-hmm. was, his, was his overriding, um, overpowering influence, which he used to advantage himself. Yes, um, that's what it sounds like, yeah. which is unfortunate because we do see the medical profession in this and I'm sure there I don't want to keep harping on but it's more to create an an awareness of the types of behavior that may be there when when you're visiting your physician just Um, perhaps be cautious would that be a sure I think the disclosure the details of this story uh, serve to illustrate the devastation that occurs when there is no resistance to conduct. Mm. And ultimately, the story ex- exposes the behavior and its consequences, and it emphasizes the importance of recognizing uh, this kind of bad conduct for what it is and having yeah. the fortitude to resist it or having the courage to stand up to it. And that's that's really what we've got to do. You have to, yeah. you have to recognize the behavior. And you have to stand up to it. Got to be courageous enough to stand up to it. Mm. Um, yeah, so. for sure. What uh, an important lesson for people to take away. But it was good that you had all those other people come forward so that you were able to get the license suspended. But as you said, it, it continues from state to state in in, uh, this, in America where here it would be province to province. I think you have to be licensed here. And I think I'm going to end that discussion right there. I 
believe in the medical profession. I worked with some amazing, amazing yeah. doctors, and I wouldn't uh, want to harm them in any way. But I think it, what your story does is just creates an additional awareness and to perhaps wake us up from our naivety, which we can tend to fall asleep into, can't we? Right. Yeah, that um, that's one of the important lessons is awareness. Um, the, impor <laughs> the importance of awareness. The importance right. of awareness. Vernon, yeah. my goodness, we did fall down. See, I didn't get to answer, ask you my 20 questions. <laughs> <laughs> You're off the hook for now. <laughs> I want to thank you for sharing that important story. I think there's just one question I do want to ask you. How did you begin to heal from all of this? Um, by uh, immediately immersing myself in my children, it just mobilizing, putting, yeah. you know, it wasn't anything I could do about the circumstances. Mm -hmm. They were what they were. I realized that. And I just had to immediately think about the children. Yeah. The, the preschool, getting their lunches together, <laughs> all the typical things. It was only, only me. <laughs> and I did have some help from parents, you know, uh, picking them up mm -hmm. after school, mm -hmm. uh, that sort of thing, and, and keeping them until I got home from work. Um, but I think that's what it was. And then uh, it wasn't too long after this that I uh, began to do other things. You know, I continued to play tennis. I enjoy music, dance, taking ballroom classes and other classes. Mm -hmm. and I've actually became an instructor um, oh, in wonderful. dance. And, you know, I just continued to do that over the years and I've been able to maintain a fairly healthy outlook. And mm -hmm. I, I consider myself to be a happy individual in spite of um, the void that there is yeah. in life, you know, without the partner I hope that I had hoped I'd spend a lifetime with. Yeah. But uh, yeah, just, Getting getting yourself busy doing all the other things that need to be done, being productive. Mm -hmm. So there wasn't any moments of emotional outbursts. Yes, distractions are a good thing, and it sounds like the children certainly gave you many of those. But were there times when you really felt you needed to sort of seek help, or did you just talk to yourself and re rationalize and reason it out? I never, I never sought any help. I, no. Uh, I think I was just so busy balancing everything, work, mm -hmm. two children, you know, from the ages of four and two and all their activities. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, a few years later, I was in a carpool with three other mothers and I was picking up the children, <laughs> dropping those children and my children off. And then, yeah. and then I wouldn't have to worry about, I could go to work and the other mothers would pick my children up and drop them off at the YMCA, which was mm. a babysitter for many yeah. years, which was yeah. within a block of where we lived in Charlotte. Mm -hmm. um, it just, it all worked out. I was, I've got a lot to be grateful for. Yeah, it certainly sounds it. So what would you say to somebody going through a divorce now? Do you have any words of wisdom that may help um, them? Hire the best attorney that you can possibly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's the best advice. You've got you've got to have a really good attorney. Okay. Getting through the emotional part, any Very words much. of wisdom there? Uh, <laughs> the same thing I did. I immerse yourself in life. Immerse uh, yourself in but, life. You know, whatever it is, whatever appeals to you, pick yourself up and go after it. Mm, okay. Uh, 
You know, I had to ask, being a grief coach, I couldn't let you <laughs> off. <laughs> it's, you know, it's not easy. There's always that lingering pain there. And and often you it's you don't get away from it. It, it it'll eat at you, but um, you got to look for healthy outlets. Mm-hmm. They're, they're out there. You just uh, grab grab on and go for it. OK. All and right. fortunate, and fortunately, I had the, I had to think about the children full time too, and mm-hmm. so I didn't have a lot of downtime to feel bad and, yeah. and sad. Yeah, you know, there were things I had to do, diapers I had to change. <laughs> <laughs> yep, <laughs> plenty yeah. of those for sure. Yeah, uh, yeah. Where can people find a copy of your book? Do you have a web a website I, for your I, book? I do have a website. It's www.deceitthebook.com. You can simply go to deceitthebook.com. Mm-hmm. And on the very first page of that website, there's, there's six or seven pages, but on the very first page of that website is a red ribbon okay. the that you can click on, and it will take you directly to the book on Amazon. Oh. You can buy the book. You can buy an ebook for five dollars and ninety five cents, or in mm-hmm. paperback that they will mail to Amazon will mail to you. Mm-hmm. I think mm-hmm. that's fourteen dollars and ninety five cents. Um, and I also have a um, audio out. You've got well. it in audio. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Are you narrating it? I am not. I just I decided there were too many bad words. I didn't want my children to ever hear me <laughs> say those bad words. <laughs> I, I wouldn't talk like this doctor talk, excuse me. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I think we're giving enough for our listeners to head on over to Amazon <laughs> and, and buy it. <laughs> if anyone wants to communicate with me, I uh, they can. They on the website. You yeah. there's a way to communicate with the author. Oh, that's wonderful. We'll make sure, Vernon, that we have all your links in the show notes for anybody interested. And if you have any questions you'd like to ask Vernon, you can certainly send them to myself. Or as as you're aware of the website, you can send them directly, or in your review on Amazon. I understand. Absolutely, I appreciate. A review, a review of the book yeah we all love reviews good right. or bad it just helps us good, improve good or bad <laughs> well vernon i am so grateful that uh, you and your team found the let's talk about grief podcast it's been a pleasure connecting and getting to know you and uh, your willingness to share your story with us in the hopes that we can help so many feel comforted and have a new perspective of the grief that um, there's a, that surrounds a divorce and how perhaps people can be a little bit more thoughtful. And uh, who knows, there may be some divorce rituals coming down. I may get to interview somebody that's written a book on that. I think it would be very healing. <laughs> well, I think this one's a good start. This is a good start. Yeah. Start there. That's called deceit. Vernon, again, thank you so very much and um, stay connected. Appreciate it very much. Thank you so much for the opportunity. You're so welcome. That's it indeed. It's a wrap, as I like to say, listeners. Uh, I'm Anne. Bye-bye for now. Well, listeners, that indeed is a wrap. Be sure to follow us by clicking on the link and you'll be the first to know when a new episode drops. And if you are feeling inspired, please leave a review. And if you are indeed grieving, please know you don't have to feel alone in your grief, but reach out. As a coach, I'm more than happy to chat with you on how coaching can both support you in your chaos and pain without forcing you to endure your grief-stricken world. You can contact me at anne at understandinggrief.com or you can visit my website at Understanding Grief. I'm Anne. Bye-bye for now.